In terms of uh, lessons learned, I'd say the one that really rises to the top is focus on the individual. And, and in particular, I'm speaking to those who um, have uh, moved up through various expressions of technical competency and now find themselves in positions as leaders where they're responsible for creating conditions in which other people do their work. Focus on the individual. To kind of make that point, since it was lessons learned from the book, I thought I'd draw upon stuff we actually put in the book. So um, on page four, down in a footnote, I uh, recollect an experience I had. I was driving along the Hudson uh, River in, in Manhattan, looked up the uh, Navy uh, Air and Space Museum, and on sitting on top of the aircraft carrier was an SR-71, a Blackbird. So I called on my Uncle Larry, who had worked on that, and I said, hey, I saw that SR-71 Blackbird. I know you worked on that when you were a junior engineer. And he said, you know, that was the best engineering experience I ever had. My first reaction to that was, that, that's insane. You know, he had, had a career in engineering. That work he was doing maybe when he was in his 20s, he, he was designing n not even the locking system, if this was a car as a, as a metaphor. It was like the little lever on the locking system. I'm trying to understand, how could that have been the best? It took years of reflection. It finally dawned on me. The reason it was the best engineering experience he had ever had is that he was part of this enormous whole of technical and engineering talent that created something as magnificent as the SR-71. That his ability to connect to this very large system was what made it the best experience. All right, so that's proof point one. Second uh, reference here is on page three, right before the Uncle Larry reference, where um, we write, on July 20th, 1969, masses crowded into Times Square, Central Park, Trafalgar Square, the city centers of the Soviet Union, North and South Vietnam, Hong Kong, and other places around the world. They gathered to watch Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin start their descent to the lunar surface. All told, 650 million people shared that experience, watching and listening in theaters, taverns, airport and train terminals, and at home in wonder and awe as Armstrong stepped onto the moon and declared, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What's the point? Those people weren't even part of the project but they wanted to connect to it in this visceral way and feel like they were part of accomplishing something gigantic, something far beyond uh, what any one of them could have accomplished on his or her own. Third proof point. Each day, people badge in, budge in, swipe in, scan in, sign in, log in, or otherwise just walk into their places of work. From that common beginning, the differences in their experiences are vast. For some, Work is marked by drudgery or even danger. Their days are filled with frustration amid the, amid the regular confusion of figuring out what to do, when and how to do it, and even why it needs to be done. Too often they're left cynical about what's going on around them and exhausted from trying to get meaningful things accomplished. However, some people experience the opposite. They are well equipped and capable of succeeding at what they've been asked to, tasked to do. They are respected and appreciating for do the, doing their work well. And they leave the workplace knowing they've added value for others and to their own lives. Why focus on the individual? Of course, that uh, difference in experience that individuals have between the drudgery, the disappointment, the danger versus the exhilaration, the exaltation of being a part of something much larger, that's the difference that leaders can create. And as a leader, you don't need reports and metrics that are lagged and aggregated and then discussed in meetings and then cl clarified and um, filtered and distilled in pre-meetings on the pre-meeting for the pre-meeting of the actual meeting, which then has a follow-up meeting to have a new report about that. What do you need to do? You need to go into the workspace, look at the individual, and look at the individual and ask the question, what experience is she or he having today? And I'll, I'll end my um, reading out of the book. Um, that mention of uh, the individual experience, that's a direct draw on lessons I learned from one of my mentors, Paul O'Neill, who was the CEO at Alcoa when it transitioned from a very dangerous place to work because of high-risk, high-hazard processes to a very safe, productive place to work despite the same high-risk, high-hazard industrial processes. And when we asked Paul how did you manage such a sprawling enterprise? You know, the dozens of plants, the many, many different countries, the, the tens of thousands of employees. Paul's answer was simple. He said, I asked a few questions every day. And they're all around focusing on the individual. 
So uh, since focusing on the individual is at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, I figure this is a key lesson. So uh, I write in the uh, acknowledgments, what was Paul's homework for us? Find people for whom you are responsible and ask them, are you treated with dignity and respect? If the answer is no, as a leader, you have work to do. Are you given whatever you need to succeed and does this bring value to your life? And are you recognized for what you do by someone whose opinion matters? And then Paul concluded his advice, conditions that generate a no to any of these merit correction.